John Tesler here with geekycool.com. I'm here with NASA scientist um, Les Johnson. He's also an author among his other endeavors. Les, welcome to geekycool.com. Oh, thanks for having me. It's nice to meet you. Re NASA's done a lot of good things with space exploration, going to the moon, now we're going back to the moon and to Mars. Do you think the 50 or so year break after we went to the moon where we just dealt with things in Earth's orbit, do you think that slowed down NASA's push towards outer space in any way? I think there was a lot to learn about the effects of deep space on the human body that we've learned from working for years in Earth orbit on the space station. Uh, there is no doubt that I think all of us, when we saw us go to the moon in the 60s, had visions of 2001, a space odyssey, really happening in 2001, right? Uh, but I think the reality of space exploration was a lot harder than people expected, a lot more unknowns about the effects of space on us. And I think the, the budget realities of what the nation was willing to spend on space really is what drove what we could do in that time frame. So I, I'm, a, uh, I'm an optimist. I try to take advantage of where we are, not lament where we could have been. But I think what we need to do is build on that experience we've gained, uh, take advantage of the lower cost launch uh, opportunities that we have today, and put together the partnerships to pick up where we left off. And not view it as lost time, view it as time we learned, we sent a lot of robotic exploration uh, probes to the outer planets and beyond, and it was really time to regroup and rethink and, and go back this time and this time to stay. What were some of the bigger missions that you were on that people would know about? That they would know about? Well, that's a challenge because most of what I work on is in the uh, robotic uh, technology missions. Uh, I launched, uh, had a project launch uh, on Artemis One as a secondary payload on its first flight. It was called the Near Earth Asteroid Scout, and that was one of 10 small payloads that uh, launched on Artemis One. I'm working on another that'll fly in 2028. I worked with the Japanese on an experiment that flew in 2010. Uh, they named it T-Rex. Uh, it was a tether experiment, tether experiment, right? That's where they got the Rex. And it was to demonstrate a new type of propulsion that didn't use any fuel, called an electrodynamic tether. Uh, basically, if you, if you think about uh, putting two magnets together and the North Pole magnets repel each other, you can create a magnetic field in wires to repel against the Earth's magnetic field and get propulsion, and that's what that experiment was all about. And then the ones that I'm working on now are primarily something called a solar sail, and those who follow space will, will be familiar with that, but it's a way to move through space without any fuel, and you're just using sunlight reflected from a big aluminum sheet that looks like a sail. And as the light reflects from the sail, it pushes on it, it moves, and it takes the spacecraft with it. So if you're looking for one of the big name missions to Mars, I didn't work on those. I'm working on the technology missions that will enable those next big missions. So that my team and the folks I work with at NASA are really laying the groundwork for how we do that next step in exploration. Um, you're also an author. Um, what are some of the books you've written that people might be interested in reading? Well, I have to give the caveat that I write on my own time. NASA doesn't endorse what I write, um, and so it's a totally separate activity. But if you're interested in going to the stars, and that's a geeky cool thing to do, uh, I wrote a book for Princeton Press that came out last October. It's called A Traveler's Guide to the Stars. It's not a textbook. It's intended for just the average person who's interested in the question, can we really ever go to the stars? And how can we get there using the known laws of physics, not having to invent a warp drive or a, a, a stargate uh, to get there? And I use that book to explain how that might work and uh, hopefully entertain a little bit along the way. And then my latest uh, science fiction novels uh, are all about first contact and deep space exploration. Uh, one of them is called Saving Proxima, which I co-wrote with my friend Travis Taylor, who you might know from... Uh, uh, the Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch uh, TV series. It's the first book in a three-book series. It came out in hardcover a couple of years ago and is now in paper. And The Space Time War, uh, which is a space opera. It's my first foray into uh, empire building in space. So I'm having fun uh, taking what we can do and extrapolating that into a future of us going to the stars. What made you want to get into working, in, working with things that go into space? Because I was a kid who watched at age seven Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. My parents woke me up 
I was probably in little footy pajamas, looking at a black and white television, watching this fuzzy picture, and it was, I was told it was important. And then my older sister let me stay up with her late uh, to watch reruns of Star Trek, and I started reading every science fiction novel I could find and decided, by golly, I want to be a scientist so I can work for NASA. So I continued reading science fiction. I studied physics. I got my bachelor's degree in chemistry and physics and then went on to graduate school at Vanderbilt uh, to, to really hone in my physics skills and from there started working for NASA. So for me, I was hooked from the moment I saw uh, two things, Neil Armstrong and Captain Kirk. Science fiction on in the movies and on television has played a big role in a lot of how people think about space. Um, is there anything you would like to see a science fiction show tackle that they haven't tackled yet? I have found that what we tend to do when we assume we go to another planet is that we're going to find another planet where we can take off our spacesuit and breathe the air and eat the food and be just fine. And, and if there's anybody there, they'll look basically humanoid like us. I'd like to see a really good treatment of what voyages to the stars might be like, where when the planets are there, they're not at all Earth-like. And if we ever want to make them that way, we have to change them to be that way. And if we encounter alien life, it's not necessarily going to be some alien monster, you know, intent on killing us, but it might be something truly alien that we have a hard time recognizing. And I realize that makes it hard on the special effects budget in movies, but I would love to see stories that realistically treat what it might be like when we encounter those planets and that extra extraterrestrial life. One of the inside jokes on the web, of course, is about the movie Armageddon mm -hmm. and how it's completely physically impossible and that NASA uses it to show everything they've gotten wrong um, in, in the movie as far as science goes. One of the things that I've always liked about that movie, because I do like that movie, is when the when Billy Bob Thornton was talking to the vice president, and the vice president, of course, asked him, well, how do we miss the asteroid? And Billy Bob Thornton goes, well, our budget, our, our budget collision is like a million dollars, and that allows us to do like 1% of the sky, and begging your pardon, it's a pretty big ass sky <laughs> and yeah. living living in cities you don't see the sky due to smog and clouds and things like that um but i was in the navy and one thing i always noticed was like when i would be overseas on deployment when you look up you're in the middle of the Atlantic, the middle of the mediterranean and all you see are stars as far as the eye can see I, I have an opinion about that. If You know, I, I firmly believe if people, if more people had that experience, two things would happen. Well, three things would happen. One, we'd start caring more about each other because we'd realize that's a big universe out there and how precious this place is that we have to live and the fact that we're all in it together. Second thing is funding for space exploration would go up because people would be asking what's out there, right? Okay. And third is I think people would become more spiritual. I think they'd start asking the big questions again of who am I, why am I here, and is there something more than me? And I think all of those, it would behoove the whole planet to be thinking about more. I think we'd all be better off. So I would, I, uh, I encourage anybody who's listening to this, plan a vacation to go out in the middle of uh, somewhere away from a city, away from city lights, and experience the sky because it is an emotional experience to see that dark sky. Now you're... You're a physicist, you work behind the scenes. Have you ever wanted to be that guy to go into space? I mean, you know, go up on like Blue Horizon or or SpaceX and do that low orbit flight? Well, if anybody's listening who would give me a free ride, let me know. But I think I'd want to wait until I go as a, and safely as a tourist. Um, I would not want to take the risk of, of not coming back. Uh, I'm a bit, a bit of a, a risk-averse person. I've never really wanted to be an astronaut. But if space travel had matured like I thought it would, and we had tourist cruises around the moon, sign me up. Uh, but in the current state of things, I'm not sure I would go. Um, I have to admit, I, I love, I want to come back to my family. I want to enjoy this beautiful planet that we live on. It would be great to experience that from space, but only if the risk were manageable. 
one of the big questions, of course, is, is there life out there? Um, you know, galaxies are astronomical in size. Do you prescribe the fact, like a lot of people, that we're the only living beings in the universe? Or do you think that there actually is life out there? Well, somewhere. Okay, well, I think there, there might be life out there somewhere. And I, I look at that from two, two different vantage points. If you look at it just from a, a naturalist scientific viewpoint, the probability of there being other intelligent tool using life anywhere near us, and I'm going to define that as within thousands of light years, right now is very, very low. But, but I say that for two reasons. One is the length of time that we've been here. I mean, if you look at, at, at Earth, it's been here four and a half billion years. Humans have been around maybe 100,000 or so out of four and a half billion, right? And so if I look at that and all of the things that led to us being here, according you know, to the evolutionary theory and naturalist explanation of that, we're here as a product not just of evolution but of history. If the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out, we might not be here, right? So when you look at it in that context, I, I think it's very unlikely that anybody else is anywhere close right now. Does that mean there may not have been a civilization four and a half million years ago? Well, maybe, but that's not now, right? So when people ask me, is there life out there? I would say, yeah, probably there is life or has been life or will be life, but chances are not right now. Yeah, I know like one of the, one of the running jokes on social media, of course, is the National Lampoon's vacation where the alien flies by and looks at Earth and goes, roll them up. Roll up the windows. <laughs> yeah. um, chances of us being visited are even smaller. I, I wrote a, uh, an essay for my science fiction publisher, Bain Books, called The Aliens Are Not Among Us. And in that, I expand on this argument of deep space and deep time. And I think that if we were ever visited by aliens, it is far more likely they came and saw dinosaurs than they came here at a time now when we humans are actually traveling in space. Because we've only been doing that for about uh, maybe 100 years, right? Or thinking about traveling in space for a hundred years, and that's a very small fraction of the time this planet's been around. Are you on any social media sites where people can? I am. I have a website, uh, lesjohnsonauthor.com. I'm on Facebook at Le I think it's boy. I better look it up. It's at Less Author, but I am on Facebook, uh, and I don't post too often on uh, Twitter, but I am on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm a mostly prolific on LinkedIn and Facebook. All right. Les Johnson, thank you for spending some time with geekycool.com. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure to meet you.